So everybody, um, welcome to the Zoom a Scientist series. This is a series that we're putting on every Tuesday and Friday from 12 to 1 p.m. As Ashley has mentioned, um, this is a live uh, webinar currently, but we are recording this and we'll put it up on our website afterwards. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be actually the presenters ourselves. So Nate, Ashley, and I all work for a program called Watershed Alliance. Um, and so we want to welcome you to this series. This is a series sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant and UVM Extension's education program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of Lake Champlain Basin. As for the Watershed Alliance program, it's a Lake Champlain Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K through 12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The series was created um, in a response to the current need for more virtual programs. Like I mentioned, it'll be every Tuesday and Friday. Uh, and today, Nate, Ashley, and I will be your guest speakers. What will we be talking about? We're gonna be doing a Watershed Science 101. So a little bit about myself. My name's Caroline Blake. I hold a master's degree in natural resources from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I also work for the Watershed Alliance program. I'm their watershed and lake education program assistant. Nate and Ashley will introduce themselves a little bit later once it gets to their part of the presentation, but it's time to get started. So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land where all the water drains and collects in the same place. I think a great way to do this is to actually demonstrate with your hands. So obviously I can't see you all in your presentation, but I want you all kind of on your own screens to cup your hands. And we're gonna give an example of what a watershed is. If you're to look at your hands and I have to zoom in a little bit, you can see that the edges of your hands, you can pretend that this is like the mountain ranges that might be surrounding your watershed. If you look at your hands, all the creases, the cracks in your hand are gonna be the rivers and the streams, etc. And at the very end, you might have an opening in your hands and this can be a lake or a body of water. What this means is that any droplet of water that hits anywhere within that mountain range is going to drain into that lake or basin. And this is an example of what a watershed is. Well, how do we determine these, what these watershed boundaries are? Well, we as scientists, we actually use something called topographic maps. If you've seen these before, great, but if you haven't, I gave an example. And coincidentally, we have some people from Washington and I used a, a map from Washington. But this is a topographic map. All of these lines are called contour lines. These lines help represent elevation. An example over here to the right is a map is 2D, but sometimes we want to be able to see in 3D and uh, make it a little bit more interactive. So when you're looking at a map, when the lines are really close together on a topographic map, that means that it's really steep. And this is an example of what the 3D image might look like. Whereas, for example, on a map, if the lines, the contour lines are very far apart, that means they're going to be a more gentle slope or a little bit more flat. But what does this mean when we talk about watersheds? Well, for example, here in this map, we have the White River. And it's emptying into this big body of water right here. And up here, there's a little tributary. So if you wanted to see where the water from this tributary is gonna end up, you could actually map out the steepest parts all around it, and you'd start determining what that watershed is for that specific area. Well, how does this all play a role? I like to use this analogy right here of these Russian nesting dolls because every single watershed is going to fit inside of a different one. And I wanna kind of walk you through where Lake Champlain is in comparison to everywhere else. So first I have this map. Each of these colors represent a sub watershed around Lake Champlain. There's actually 11, just a fun fact. But then let's zoom out a little bit further. And if I were to take away all those different colors, those sub watersheds, they all make up something called the Lake Champlain Basin. So all of this area in green is gonna be part of our basin here um, in Vermont, New York and parts of Quebec. Let's zoom out a little bit further. 
So just to orient yourself a little bit more, right here on the side, that's gonna be Lake Champlain area. Unfortunately, this map cut out a portion of Vermont, which we joked about scrolling in a little bit of Vermont in order to have us be represented more. But that Lake Champlain Basin is even part of a bigger part. This is called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin. What that means is all of these colored areas, when a droplet of water hits this, has the ability to drain out through the St. Lawrence River. It's all connected. But again, that nesting doll idea is to zoom out even further. And you can see that here is a picture um, of North America. And you can see that all of the area in red, any droplet of water that hits in that area actually will eventually drain or has the ability to drain into the Atlantic Ocean. And this is all part of a watershed. But again, this presentation is more specific to our Lake Champlain Basin. So some fun facts. If you look at this map over here, when we're talking about Lake Champlain, it starts all the way down here, sorry, right down here in Whitehall. And even this area is all part of Lake Champlain. So what you might notice is that it's a pretty long and skinny lake. Um, as for numbers wise, if you wanted to know how long it is, it is 120 miles long and roughly about 12 miles wide, the widest point being just a little bit north of Burlington. As for its depth, at its deepest point, Lake Champlain is about 400 feet, but average wise, it, the depth is about 65 feet. If you were to do the square miles of this whole area, which is all part of the basin, it's about 8,234 square miles, which is quite large in the grand scheme of things. Some last couple of fun facts for this area is what direction does Lake Champlain flow? It actually surprisingly flows north and it leaves Lake Champlain up through the Richelieu River, which is in Quebec, and then empties out into the St. Lawrence River Way. Within this lake that you all see, there's actually different lake segments. There's five to be example, we've got examples. We've got the South Lake down here. We've got our main lake. And we've got three other ones, one right here, here, and here. So within each of these, there's different stressors that we face here on Lake Champlain. I'm not going to go in depth about all of these stressors. The reason being is the next couple of weeks, we're going to actually have other presenters, scientists, talking more specifically about each of these. But these are a list um, of some examples that are threatening our basin. So phosphorus, it's a natural um, thing. We need it in order to survive. But access, excessive amounts of it can cause algae blooms, um, sediment erosion, things like that. Aquatic invasive species coming in and out of our lakes from boats, from fishing, etc. Crude oil transport. Uh, we've got some railways along our rivers and lakes here in Vermont, and that poses a threat as well. Uh, Stormwater runoff, microplastics is a big one. So even in our clothing today, or plastic water bottles, when those break down, they're being emptied into our watershed and it's causing uh, quite a bit of problems. And of course, climate change, um, which will be discussed later in a presentation as well. So this is going to be our first polling question, your ability to jump in and Ashley is going to launch the poll. Great. So that should be up on everyone's screen. Um, and I'll just read through. We'll leave this up here for about 30 seconds. Lake Champlain is considered one of the best bass fishing lakes in the United States. True or false? So go ahead and type in your response. And if you don't see the pop-up polls block, that's totally A-OK. -okay. Go ahead and just type your answer right here into the, into the chat box. And this is true if, um, if you're, great. Look at all the responses flowing in here. Ashley, just as a heads up, I do not see the polling screen on my screen, and I usually did. All right, so it looks like I'm going to end the poll and just share the results here. Lots All right. of said true. Yeah, so we said it actually is true. Uh, Lake Champlain is uh, known for it to be one of the best bass fishing lakes in the United States. 
Awesome. All right, I'm gonna to skip to the next slide and it's going to be Ashley's turn to present. Great. So hi everyone, my name is Ashley and I'm the Watershed and Lake Education Coordinator here at the University of Vermont Extension with Lake Champlain Sea Grant. And so like Caroline, I also have a master's degree in natural resources. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit more today about specifically lake monitoring techniques. So thinking about um, how do we figure out how healthy kind of our, our water is in Lake Champlain and Caroline gave a great example about where all that water is coming from throughout the watershed and some of the pollutants it's picking up on the way. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of our on water techniques. So on the screen right now you're seeing our research vessel, the Melisira, on the left there. And so that's a 45 foot vessel and that's pretty much what's used um, by all of our scientists in the Rubenstein Ecosystem Science Laboratory on the waterfront, which is just behind ECHO, if you've ever been down there in Burlington. Um, and we use this for a range of tests I'm gonna talk about, but I just wanted to show you this picture because you can see at the back of the boat, there's that big metal A-frame, and that's actually really important because that's how we deploy a lot of our equipment. Um, and so thinking about monitoring, you kind of have to ask two questions. So what type of information do you want to collect? And then how are you actually going to collect that data? And so on the on the bottom here, you can see this black and white disc in the water. And there's actually a student who's deploying one over the side of the Melisira last summer. Um, and this is a Secchi disc. This is actually a really old piece of monitoring equipment, um, but is simple in its design and is very effective. I'm not going to talk too much about it because actually Nate will talk more about this um, when we're chatting about stream monitoring, but I just wanted to toss this out there as a pretty cool tool that's used to measure water clarity, and it's actually pretty easy. You could just make this at home. You can see that it's attached to a um, tape measure. So that's kind of neat. All right, so I want, I just have a quick poll for you. I wanna know who has been out on a lake or who has been out on, um, who has been out. So go ahead and just, I'm not even going to launch the poll because uh, we'll just put some quick answers in the chat box here and I'll check them out. Nice. Lots of people have been out in the lake. Lots of people have been out on other lakes. Cool. All right. So you'll probably be able to make some connections about uh, some of the pieces I'm going to talk about then. So the first piece of equipment that I want to talk about is our CPD. And so this is an acronym and it stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And this is probably one of the most commonly used pieces of equipment in limnology, and so, which limnology is just the study of lakes. And so looking at this piece of equipment, we've got two pictures. The picture on the right actually shows me deploying this uh, piece of equipment last summer. And then the picture on the left shows kind of all of the components that make up this um, piece of equipment. And so you can see it's a lot of just tubes and cylinders. And basically each individual tube you're seeing is leading to a new test. Um, and so most of these pieces of equipment monitor conductivity, temperature, and depth at the baseline. But additionally, on our model, we've actually added other sensors that are going to monitor, monitor fluorescence, which is looking at um, basically phytoplankton or algae communities in the water, and then light. So monitoring light throughout the water column. And so I want you to think about if you were standing either on a dock or maybe on a boat looking over the side and you had a paper towel tube, kind of a long, narrow tube. And if you were to look down from the surface of the water all the way to the bottom in a straight line, that's considered a water column. And so this CTD is a cool piece of equipment because it basically is going to give us a profile of exactly what's happening from the top all the way to the bottom. And so it's great because it gives us lots and lots of data in a really short amount of time. It only takes probably three minutes to deploy this, even in the deepest places of Lake Champlain, um, even out in the main lake where it gets to over 400 feet. Um, and you can use this in two ways. So the way that we use it here mostly is through by deploying it. So using the A-frame to deploy it down and then bringing it back up and uploading the data. You could also use this on a mooring, so you could actually stick it on the bottom of the lake and leave it there um, all, all summer. But one of the challenges is that this only gives you information for that specific spot in the lake. So if you think about when you're trying to ask big questions, you actually have to do the test either a lot of 
um, in a lot of different places all around the same time to get a bigger data set that helps you understand that. So we're going to look at a couple uh, graphs from our CTD here um, from last year. And I want to show you the type of information that, this sen that these sensors give us. So looking at the CTD here, you can see it's kind of, it's Kind of a complicated graph, but the most important thing to know is that everything is relative to depth. So on the left hand side, I'm kind of showing you that up at the top, that's the surface of the water. And then as you move down, that whole axis is all just depth and it brings you to the bottom of the lake. And so we have color coded lines and each of those lines is one of the sensors that we've talked about. So looking at that yellow line first, we'll start there. Um, you'll see that that says PAR or radiance, and that's actually just kind of the scientific measurement for light. So looking at how much light is entering the water column. And so from this, we can observe that at the top of the water column, there's a lot of light coming in, and then it kind of slowly drops off. And that makes sense, right? That kind of makes sense with what you would imagine um, to happen in really deep water. Um, the next line we can look at is our green line. And so our green line is actually showing us that's the fluorescence reading. So that's showing algae in the water column, specifically phytoplankton, so the plant-like algae. Um, and this is showing us that there is kind of a, a bunch of little spikes. And so those are probably different communities um, living in the water column um, at different depths. And so depending on the type of algae, they actually have different preferences in where they like to be, and some are more buoyant than others. Um, and so that kind of is how we can explain some of those little peaks there. And then looking at our last two lines, our blue line is our level of dissolved oxygen throughout the water column. And looking at this line, you'll kind of notice that the orange line, which is temperature, is they're kind of like a mirror image of each other almost. Think of like butterfly wings. And the reason that is, is because they have a um, converse relationship. So you would expect water near the top of uh, the surface to be really warm. Think about if you've ever like, you know, jumped into the water or if you're swimming in really shallow water, it tends to be warm during the summer. And so this, that's kind of what we're seeing here. But then as the depth increases, so as we move down in our graph here, it starts to get colder. And I won't go into that too much, but nope, that's okay, Caroline, um, that's great. I won't go into it too much, but basically what's happening is that when water is colder, it's actually heavier, so it sinks to the bottom, and then water that's warmer um, kind of floats on top. And so this piece here where we see a really drastic temperature change um, is something really, really special. And so we're actually gonna kind of circle that. So this is our thermocline. And so that just shows that there's this spot where basically the temperature changes really fast. And that's really important because lakes actually create layers, um, kind of like if you think about a cake. So you'll get a layer on the top. You can kind of see where that warm water is. Um, and then you'll get this section in the middle where the temperature is changing really quickly. And then this section on the bottom. And there are special names for each of these sections, the epilimnium, metalimnium, and the hypolimnium. But what's important to know about that is that each of those sections actually can't really mix with each other. Um, so usually the top section tends to be really nutrient rich. Um, and then the bottom section tends to be really high in dissolved oxygen. So that's where a lot of cold water fish species are going to want to live um, throughout the year. And so this graph was taken on 9-24, so September 24th last year. Um, and then I wanted to show you real quick, now that you have a sense of what these look like, a uh, graph from a little bit later. So this is 1028. So this is about a month later in Lake Champlain. And you'll notice that this looks very different. So our temperature lines and our dissolved oxygen lines are going straight down. And so what's happening in the Northeast in October? It's getting a lot colder. And so the lake actually is doing something really special at this time, it's turning over. So just to get a sense of what happens throughout the season in the lake below the surface, um, I have a little graphic I just want to share with you that shows. So thinking about in the summer, this is kind of like the first graph we looked at. Um, you get those three layers, you move into the autumn, things get a little colder and actually the water starts mixing and turning over. It kind of um, throughout the winter settles to be um, 
very close in temperature with a, a small deviation. And then the spring, it turns over again. So we're actually getting ready for that to happen um, out in Lake Champlain as the days get warmer. The next piece of monitoring I just want to talk about is using a plankton tow. And so this is a pretty cool um, feature. We also use the A-frame for this. And so the net on the left is just kind of showing you what it looks like. And so you can see that it kind of funnels down. It's made out of mesh into this little sampling bucket at the bottom. And so basically, you can use this two ways. One is you could actually tow it behind a vehicle or behind the vessel um, at a horizontal angle, or you could do a vertical drop. So if you wanted to sample a specific depth, you could pull it at that depth, or you could drop it all the way to the bottom and sample the entire water column. And so the picture on the right is just showing we did two samples at different depths. And so you can see how different the populations of algae are at different depths. And so I think this is the on the left um, the lighter colored green water is the surface and the bottom is um, basically a integrated sample that we took from the top section of the water column and so i just want to highlight a couple cool um, photos these are actually pictures that i took on our light microscope in the rubenstein lab um, from the samples that you just saw and so these are actually diatoms which is a type of phytoplankton and I just wanted to share them because I think they're really beautiful. So these are really tiny. Um, I've blown them up. I think this is probably on like a 40X microscope lens. Um, and so you can see this is Asterionella. This is a really pretty um, diatom. And you can see that each of these lines, see how it's kind of like a star? Each line is actually a, diff is a single organism. So they actually kind of stick together. Um, and this helps them float in the water column. And then the next one, this one's really unique. This actually is what our boat, our research vessel, is named after. So the Melisira. So this is uh, Alicasira is what it's now called, as sometimes names in science change. And so these are two different species. You can tell by the different, um, the different width of, the, um, of each of the organisms, which is really cool. And so each square that you see on here, each little square, is actually a different organism. So these also colonize. They stick together. And then let's see, I've got a quick polling question. So I want to know what you all know about lake monitoring. So I'm launching the poll right now. And the question is, what might you use to test water quality in the lake? A secchi disc, a CPD, a plankton tow, or all of the above? Great, and just a reminder, if you don't see the poll, A-OK -okay to toss your answer in the chat box here. Awesome, all right, let's see, what do people think? Let me share the results with you. We have, basically, you're all right, all of the above, plankton toe, CTD, secchi disc, yeah, those are all great tools um, that limnologists use, and they're tools that we use all the time out on our research vessel. Great, and I'm gonna hand it over to Nate, and Nate is gonna share with you a little bit about stream monitoring, so we're gonna transition a little bit. Great, thanks, Ashley. Uh, so, Ashley just did a wonderful job of walking us through some common monitoring techniques when we're out on the lake. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about stream monitoring. So, when we go out and do stream monitoring, we like to break it down into sort of three different categories. So we have biological monitoring. So we're looking for certain indicator species. And we're going to get into what an indicator species is in a little bit. So just put a pin in that. Uh, we also do chemical monitoring, where we're measuring and testing water for specific pollutants. So we want to know what is flowing through our waterways, what pollutants are entering from industry or from runoff, maybe it's from an agricultural field or from an urban area. Um, so we're testing for certain pollutants or certain chemicals that are in our streams. And then we like to do physical monitoring. I think of this as more of the stream itself. So what's the structure of the stream like? What is the bottom of the stream like? Does it have secure banks? Does it have a riparian corridor? Does it have access to a floodplain? Um, so more of the what makes the stream 
uh, what makes the stream flow, if you will? What are the boundaries of the stream? So Ashley is going to drop a link in the chat box to a YouTube video. It's going to start about halfway through the YouTube video, and that's on purpose. We just want you to watch sort of the second half of the video. So there's the link right now. You can click on that link, watch that video, and then just come on back uh, once you're done. So it should be about five and a half minutes. Uh, and after that time, you'll hear me calling you back to the webinar. Uh, if you haven't already joined us again. So go ahead, click on that link, watch that video, and then come on back to the webinar. So just a reminder, open up the chat box and click on the link in the chat box.
All right, so if you're still watching that video, we're going to get started again in just a few seconds. Um, now that you have the link to that video, you can go back and watch the rest of it or watch it from the beginning if you want. Um, we can talk about how to how to collect benthix right at the beginning of that video. So if you're looking for some tips to go into your stream and, and look for bugs, there's some information on that in the first few minutes of the video. So come on back and we're gonna move along here. And jump to the next slide, Caroline. All right. So what in the heck were those things you all were just looking at in that video? So those benthic macroinvertebrates that live in our stream, those are a great indicator species. Uh, we care about this because indicator species can give us an idea of the health of a given ecosystem. So by studying benthic macroinvertebrates and figuring out their diversity, so how many different kinds there are and their abundance, so how many of them there are, uh, that gives us a clue uh, into water quality. They make great indicator species because those nymphs and larvae, they spend a long time in uh, a very confined area. So they spend their life in one stream reach, they'll be there and whatever flows down that river they're exposed to. They're super easy to collect, you just turn over some rocks and you can find them. Uh, and each species that you find has a different level of tolerance to pollution. So that photo there is a photo of a stonefly. They're really sensitive to pollution. So having a good diversity and abundance of stoneflies is a great indicator that you have some pretty solid, uh, good water quality. So we're gonna launch a quick poll. Uh, you'll see it pop up on your screen now. So. Have you ever seen a benthic macroinvertebrate in a stream before? Yes or no? So I wanna know, have you ever seen a benthic macroinvertebrate in a stream before? A is yes, B is no. And again, if you don't see that poll popping up, uh, feel free to drop your answer in the chat box, or maybe you wanna tell us uh, your favorite benthic macroinvertebrate in the chat box, that's good too. Great, so yeah, it looks like most folks have actually seen them in the stream. There's a good amount of you, 25% roughly, that have not. Uh, so maybe those of you that haven't, now you are inspired to go out and uh, take a look, go turn over a rock and see what you can find. Cool, so that's our biological sampling. Now we're gonna talk about chemical sampling. So this photo right here is a multi-parameter probe. This is very similar to the model that the Lake Champlain Research Institute uses to do long-term monitoring of tributaries of the rivers that flow into Lake Champlain. Uh, so each one of those little uh, pipes coming out of the end, each one of those nodes, those sensors, measures a different variable. So some of the things you might look for are dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, pH. You might measure conductivity. All of these uh, you know, are gonna measure obviously different pollutants, but also give you clues to what's going on. And these are real time samples, right? So if you collect these chemical samples, Every day over the course of 20 years, you might have a really good idea of what's happening with pollutants uh, in our streams. Now we're gonna transition to, uh, again, sort of the physical side of the stream. So taking a step back and looking at the big picture, the makeup, what makes the stream the stream, right? So we have these good riparian corridors in this image. Uh, we have this run riffle pool structure, this meandering channel. And then you can see there's this wide open floodplain just beyond the corridors where that river can occasionally flood, enter that floodplain, and then fall back into the channel. That's uh, what a healthy river does. It floods and then it goes back into the channel. Uh, and so we can jump ahead to the next slide. And here we're looking at uh, sort of thinking about stream bed composition and erosion. So we have two photos of two different streams here. The one on the right, uh, you can see there's a really good riparian corridor on either side of the stream, tons of trees, overhanging limbs to provide shade. 
Uh, there's a solid structure on the stream bed, a lot of different sizes of cobbles and big boulders. Uh, there's, you're not seeing any signs of erosion along the stream banks. When you look on the left, you see there's virtually no riparian buffer. We have a little bit of grass, but no shrubs or trees to help hold in that bank. And so we're seeing that stream bank erode away. We have that cut bank there. Also, if you look into the stream, you can see that it looks like there's a lot of silt and fine sediment. Uh, that's a sign that there's probably a lot of erosion happening nearby, possibly upstream as well. When you look at cobble embeddedness, so you go into the stream and you look at the stream bed itself, this can give you an idea of how much erosion might be taking place nearby, how much fine sediment is entering the stream. So you want a lot of different size cobbles uh, on your stream bed to provide uh, varying habitat niches for those benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, so if you're entering a stream and it's all fine silt and sand, then you know there might be some issues with erosion. Also, a lot of sediment input can bring with it uh, phosphorus or other pollutants, uh, like storms, things that might be in stormwater. And so it's an indication that maybe uh, your water quality may be declining. Again, turbidity. So we have, uh, turbidity is just a measure of water clarity. So if you look on the right, that's called a turbidity tube. Uh, and on the bottom there, that black and white disc, that's very similar to that Secchi disc that Ashley was talking about earlier. So if you fill this tube up with water from the stream and look down uh, and slowly drain the level of water until you can see that Secchi disc nice and clearly, say you got about halfway down where the cursor is on the screen, then that measurement will give you a quantifiable uh, measurement of your water quality and a measurement of how turbid the water is. Again, so we're thinking about those physical aspects that make a stream healthy. You can see on the right, uh, we have a channelized stream. That means there's no meandering in it. Maybe that uh, stream is lined with concrete to hold it in place or it's armored with riprap or armor stone to define that channel and move it in a straight path and out of, uh, out of the stream or, or out of the urban center uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we have runoff entering directly into the stream. We have point source pollution, uh, no riparian vegetation. And then on the left, again, you're seeing those, those riparian buffers, a floodplain, good meanders, uh, deep sections, fast sections, shallow, fast moving sections. So a lot of variety in that stream. All right, one, poll, one more polling question uh, here for this section. So true or false? A healthy stream should be allowed to sometimes flood the surrounding area. So Ashley's gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Uh, again, true or false? A healthy stream should be allowed to sometimes flood the surrounding area. True or false? Remember we talked about this uh, a little bit earlier. What do you think? And again, if you aren't seeing that pop up, go ahead and uh, enter your answer into the chat box. <clears throat> Great, yeah, that's true, right? Healthy streams flood, that's what streams do. You get a lot of precipitation, you have a spring, big spring melting event like uh, we've been having over the last couple of days here in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, streams are gonna flood, rivers are gonna flood and they need that access to the flood, flood plain. Uh, sometimes we have development in the way and we develop the floodplains and that's really sad, right? People can lose homes, uh, things can, you know, bridges can wash out, there can be a lot of damage, um, but rivers flood and that's something we can anticipate, right? Okay, what can we do to help maintain water quality? So we have a raise the blade campaign. That means you raise the blade on your lawnmower from uh, you know, anywhere below three inches to above three inches and you leave your grass clippings in place to act as natural fertilizer. Uh, you can pick up after your pets. Don't let your dog poop uh, flow into the stream, right? We want to pick up after our pets. 
Uh, we can limit the fertilizer and pesticide use that we're using in our lawns or our home gardens. Uh, clean, drain, dry, that's to help stop the spread of invasive species. So we wanna be conscious when we're moving from one water body to the next that we're not picking up any hitchhikers and we're not transporting invasive species. We can help reestablish vegetation. Maybe we have a small stream running through our property that we wanna plant some native shrubs or some tall grasses along the edges of to help, uh, help hold in and prevent erosion. Uh, we can make a rain garden to help, again, slow the flow of uh, maybe some storm water we have. So uh, picking up nutrients, excess nutrients, and slowing the flow of storm water. Uh, we can make a rain barrel, again, same idea, to capture some of that storm water and then to use later on during a, a not so wet time to water our gardens with, perhaps. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Ashley. She's gonna challenge you all to take up the baton and run with it and uh, have a little take home activity that will help you connect a little bit better to your watershed. Yeah, thanks Nate. And so actually this has already been coming alive in the Q and A box and the chat box. Folks have all kinds of questions about like, how do you make your own uh, monitoring equipment, which is awesome. That's actually what our take home activity um, is gonna be. So. I think one thing that we thought is actually super easy because it's springtime in Vermont, it's raining a lot. And so um, we were like, you could make your own rain gauge. And so this is pretty easy. I mean, you could do this with any type of like bought, like plastic bottle or like a mason jar, something like that. Um, and so there are some directions. We're going to post a link here in the chat box for you. There's some directions on how to do that. Um, and so that's a cool take home activity. And then I also just wanted to mention a couple things. I threw a couple links in the chat box as well. And so those are also on, kind of on how to build your own kick net um, stuff. And so I just want to say that if you wanted to make a leaf pack, which is something that you could leave out in the stream and then come back and grab like after a few days, um, you basically could use the kind of mesh stuff that like potatoes or oranges come in and you basically just put a bunch of leaves and then you tie it really securely. Um, and you can just leave it there for a couple days and come back and then there will be actually benthics that are living inside of that. Um, and then another one is if you had like an old screen or something, if your parents had one laying around, um, you could use that with a couple poles to just kind of make what you saw Nate using kind of a similar um, kick net idea. So that's a great thing too. And so we want to open it up for questions that you might have. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple questions, but um, don't leave us yet. We're going to um, launch a feedback poll here. And so if you want to start putting some questions in the Q&A box, we'll start answering them. And while we're doing that, I'm going to launch our feedback poll. If while you're, um, while you're hanging out, if you want to go ahead and, and answer that, I'll just leave that up in the background. Oh, great question from Amanda. So Amanda's asking, what is a rain garden? Um, Nate, do you want to take that one? Sure, Ashley. Uh, sorry, I was furiously typing away in the chat box answering other questions. So, uh, rain garden, was that the question? Yes, yeah, what is a rain garden? Great, so uh, a rain garden is something you might plant on, say, the corner of a parking lot or near a driveway where there might be a lot of stormwater runoff happening and you want a way to slow down that flow rather than having it enter directly into a stream or into a storm drain and then a stream. Uh, you can strategically plant a rain garden, uh, which is maybe home to some plants that can handle a lot of water and then periods of drought. So it's a specially designed garden to handle uh, lots of rainwater and lots of storm water. Uh, and sort of uptake some of those nutrients and slow down that flow. Um, Ashley, we've got some, oh, there we go. Somebody asked about the feedback poll. We also have a question in the chat box, Ashley, about people are wondering how they can get access to these resources um, once the chat box closes with the links that you sent. So it looks like Ashley's still mute, muted, but I would recommend uh, clicking on those links now and opening them up. We also will follow up with a lot of resources on our virtual learning page. 
uh, and we can put that link. I think we were already planning on putting that link in the chat box. So Lake Champlain Sea Grant's virtual learning page um, will follow up with some of these resources there. Um, the Lake Champlain Basin program has a lot of awesome resources available. So but if there's a particular link that was dropped in the chat box just now, I would recommend clicking on it, opening it up so you have it uh, for future use. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nate. And I was just going to hop in. Um, somebody was asking what a rain gauge is, which is a great question. I didn't elaborate on that. So basically, um, something that gets monitored all the time is how much rainfall happens in a set like period. And so you could monitor rainfall for an hour, a day, a week. And so a rain gauge, basically, it's just a piece of equipment that almost like a cup sits out and it collects rain just as it's raining. And then you can measure it. Um, and that can give you some cool data about how much rain has fallen in a certain amount of time. Oh, what's a, what's a Secchi disk or whatever it's called? I love that. Yeah. So um, actually, Carolyn, are you still sharing your screen? I am. Could you pop back into um, our that either Nate's slide or my slide on that, and I'll just we can point it out. I'm um, using so a, Secchi, fancy, a fancy tool right now. I think I can go back to this slide. I'm just trying to figure out which one it might be. Great. So yeah, so a Secchi disc, it's that black and white disc that you see at the bottom of that measuring tape. And it's basically just, it's crafted that way specifically for the black and white contrast. So you can see it underwater. Ashley and Nate, I don't have access to see the question A, so I'm gonna have you guys vet those and see if there's any that we should answer out loud. Yeah, it looks like. Nate, I think you're yeah. muted. There you go. Yeah, so I was just saying, I think uh, given time, maybe we should uh, move forward, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll have our contact information up on the screen in just a second. And um, I'll go ahead and type my email address in the chat box and I'm sure these folks will do the same. Uh, and you can send an email and ask any specific content questions or anything you might be curious about. Feel free to follow up on, uh, on that with us. All right, so, let the last couple of people answer that feedback poll. This is a great way for us to build this program. Again, we're just brand new to it due to the whole uh, change of being in person to being virtual. So feedback is phenomenal. Please be honest. Uh, we love to hear it as we make tweaks here and there. We'll launch it for maybe 10 more seconds and then do our final slide to send you all on your way. Sounds good. Go ahead, Caroline. All right, last but not least is what's happening next. Um, if you want to join us next Tuesday, April 7th from 12 to 1 p.m., we've got a guest speaker who's going to be talking about oil spills and how to prevent them on Lake Champlain, as well as just some extra information. Um, so same way that you sign up for this one, go to our virtual learning page. There'll be a link to register for that specific program. And we'll be doing this every Tuesday and Friday until the end of June. So. Look forward to seeing you all again. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.